now I'm joined by John Burko, former Speaker of the House of Commons. John, good morning. Camilla, good morning to you. Thank you for joining me. L let's grasp the nettle instantly. You've been described as both a serial liar and a serial bully by this uh, Commons investigation. You've not been allowed to have a parliamentary pass. I never asked for one. So this idea that you've been banned from Westminster, talk me through that and, and your reaction to how you've been labelled, because it is extraordinary for people watching. You go from being Speaker of the House of Commons, a very prominent and indeed recognisable figure in Westminster, to effectively not being able to get into the building. I've not been banned from Westminster, that's the first point. The second point is that I was told that I couldn't have a parliamentary pass. Camilla, I didn't ask for a parliamentary pass, so it's a completely toothless, meaningless, absurd and implausible sanction. Thirdly, what I would say to you is, look, I'm not without flaw or blemish to err is human. I've made my fair share of mistakes, but I don't believe that I've bullied anyone in any way, anywhere, at any time. And when it was suggested that I had lied, many things have been said about me over the years, but not that I'm other than straightforward and candid. I haven't lied about anything, and I don't believe that I bullied anyone. I think perhaps the most significant thing to say is this. It was an amateurish, ramshackle, hopelessly flawed process of investigation undertaken into me. And the most important point resulting from it yes. is that those historic investigations of matters going back 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 years immediately ceased after my case. So everybody now is capable of being investigated only if a complaint is made within 12 months. I had people making allegations about what I did or didn't say unwitnessed in a room a decade or more earlier. It's an absurd process of no weight or credibility. I think you've called it Kafkaesque in a piece that you wrote for The Telegraph last and year. To say it's a kangaroo court is a very marked insult to let, kangaroos. Let, let me just put you a, a quote uh, that Catherine Stone, who was the parliamentary Standards Commissioner, she, she spoke to the Times yesterday and she said, forgive me a wry smile to myself. Mr Burko appointed me and he forgot to say that in his many and various interviews where he was critical of me. So he appointed me knowing very well that I already had a reputation for being independent, impartial, thorough and fair. There is an irony here that you've been brought down by the very woman you appointed. I appointed her. And I never sought to hide the fact that I appointed her. So when Catherine Stone says with a wry smile that I neglected to point out, I didn't neglect to point out, it wasn't germane to any of the interviews that I undertook. The question of who appointed her is totally irrelevant to the fairness or otherwise of the process that was undertaken. It was a lousy process, amateurishly conducted, ill-conceived and abandoned after my case. That is the brutal, simple, unmistakable and incontestable reality of the matter. So she's had her say and I've answered her conclusively and in terms. Uh, talking about brutal realities, you did try and stop Brexit, didn't you? No. As speaker. No, I didn't Many people try watching this will think that you very much tried to, re to, to frustrate at least the process, no. especially when you said, no, there couldn't be another vote because we've already had a meaningful vote. You've got people on the Tory right tearing their hair out at you, thinking that you're not impartial. We know that you've got stickers on the back of your car talking about uh, this a is B all word no doubt to Brexit. Sincere. I mean, you're an arch-Remainer. Could this you is ever no be impartial sincere. in that role? This is all no doubt sincere, Camilla, but it suffers from the disadvantage of, without exception, being completely wrong. But you First are all, an arch Remainer. Let me answer the point okay. about the three votes. Yeah. And you say that I angered, to the point of enormous consternation, the Conservative right in ruling that there couldn't be a third vote. No, sorry, that's not correct. The government was annoyed about it. Actually, Jacob Rees-Mogg, as the Hansard record will attest, was all in favour of my decision on that matter. And so were a very large number of other Brexiteers. What I was simply saying is that Theresa May cannot seek to bamboozle the House and beat it over the head by continually putting to the House a proposition in defiance of the same question convention again and again and again. So that, that wasn't generally role, ridiculed. Though? I mean, you're or only, you said earlier you're only human. You obviously have this visceral hatred of Brexit. You said that it was the biggest mistake that had been made since the Second World War. I said it was the most colossal foreign policy blunder in the post-war so period. So you privately right. think that. How on earth can you carry out your role when you're meant to be impartial, 
clearly your whole opinion on the issue is totally screwed. It's no. totally skewed. No. The logic of that argument, Camilla, and I know you've got a job to do, is that anybody in order to be speaker has never previously had or does not entertain an opinion. The issue for Speaker is not that he or she has never had an opinion about anything, but that he or she discharges the duty of the office of Speaker fairly, impartially, dispassionately, and with a view to ensuring that all views are represented. And that's exactly what I did on Brexit. If you cast your mind back, and I know you've got a keen historical sense of these matters, Camilla, <laughs> to 2013, you will be well aware of the John Barron Amendment taken to yes. the Queen's speech by the Conservative Member of Parliament for Billericay, John Barron. That was a, an amendment to the Queen's speech calling for a national referendum on British membership of the European Union. I selected that amendment. Yes. If I was this unfair, arch-remainer, frustrate the okay. Brexiteers at all costs character, as which you try to typecast me, yes. I wouldn't have selected it. I'm Why only did I do what it? GB viewers might think. Why did I do it? I did it because I thought it was the fair thing to do. So I was fair to the Brexiteers when they were a strong but minority force within the okay. governing party. So I did the same for the Remainers let me put this to after you, 2016, and that's what the Brexiteers All didn't right. like. Let me put this to you. Did you quite like being at the centre of that story? I say this because I'm going to quote your biography here. Bobby Friedman described described you as having no chance of any approach. Burko is somebody who has always loved being the centre of attention. Aren't you a bit of a show-off? And that's why you made such a splash during the Brexit debates. I did what I thought was right. So the answer to that is, yes, I am a bit of a show-off. <laughs> I think most politicians are to a degree. And if you say, ah, oh, do you like the sound, mellifluous or otherwise, of your own voice, I plead guilty to that. Do I talk too much? I plead guilty to that. Was I unfair? No. Did I try to do the right thing at all times by all parts of the House and all shades of opinion? I did so relentlessly for over 10 years. And I make the point again, it is quite an important point, whether people agree with it or not, that what I was seeking to do, Camilla, was not to frustrate, to impede, mm. to retard, to prevent Brexit. What I was seeking to do was to facilitate the House of Commons in the discharge of its functions. It wasn't for that, the Speaker to support but and wasn't implement there a Brexit little bit, or to prevent can it. Can I say this? Wasn't there a little bit of an attempt to humiliate Boris Johnson because you just don't like him. Is Sorry, when and where did I seek to well, humiliate Boris Johnson? Well, I get this Boris impression Johnson? that... I mean, what I, did I, I say or I've do heard, to try to humiliate Well, this him. idea that he was trying to deliver Brexit, this ready-made, oven-made deal, and that he, his entire premise was on the basis of delivering the Brexit that Theresa May couldn't. And I just wonder, on a personal level, did you dislike Boris Johnson? No, on the contrary. In fact, why should I have been out to get Boris? When he was Foreign Secretary, and he and I got on very well, he was always very amicable and good-natured, he invited me to the Foreign Office residence and yes. we played tennis together. Okay. And I had the very great and delectable joy of beating him six love, six love, six love. And we had okay. a very convivial lunch Why afterwards. don't I put it like I had this? no reason I'll to feel like... any animus okay. towards him at all. Can I ask what you this, he then? tried to do was to humiliate the House of Commons by illegally proroguing Parliament. And I remind you, just in case it has Baroness slipped your Hale. mind... I was there. I was there when she read out the reading with nil. her spider brooch. 11-0, was I it, I get Camilla? that. No, I know. As a football man, you'll think that's a good result. However, on the subject of Boris... OK, let me put it a different way. You obviously speak of the House of Commons. You witness much parliamentary talent and there perhaps a lack thereof. Who do you think has been the worst Prime Minister who served while you were Commons Speaker? Oh, by a country mile, Boris Johnson was right. the worst Prime Minister. But that <laughs> doesn't that? mean that I feel personal hostility to him. I did feel personal hostility Why did you think he was terrible? Did you not think he was fit for office? No, I didn't think he was fit for office. I thought he was immoral, unethical, unfocused, utterly devoid of any coherent vision or plan for and the country. He's still and got also, a parliamentary path. He is, I think without doubt, the worst public speaker of any Prime Minister what? I've ever heard. I've never known anybody Hang on. so fumbling, he must have quite hesitant, liked his speech when the Queen died. and useless. He made one good speech, one good speech... He made a rousing Brexit somebody. speech when he left as Foreign Secretary and over Chequers. No, he made a very poor quality Who speech from the backbenches. Who was your favourite orator in the House, then? From the backbenches, he made the worst speech I've Who heard. Who was your favourite speaker in the House by the time 
in all of the time that you were there? My favourite public speaker yeah. or Prime Minister? Yeah, parliamentarian, even if Prime Minister, yes. Prime Ministerial or otherwise. I would say that the best debater I ever heard in the House of Commons was Robin Cook, closely followed by Ken Clark and yes. Malcolm Rifkin. But I would say Robin was the most coruscating debater I ever heard. In terms of sheer fluency, Camilla, I would say the best public speaker, he wasn't as good a debater, I heard, was Tony Benn. Yes. And there is a difference Tony which ben, yes. may or may not interest your listeners and viewers. Robin wasn't quite the orator that Tony Benn was, but Robin was formidable in the interstices of debate. He was the quickest witted, he was the sharpest, he was the most excruciatingly painful to be attacked by in debate. Tony wasn't really interested in debate. Often he would say to people trying to interrupt him, well, if the honourable gentleman doesn't mind, he can try to catch Mr Speaker's eye in due course. I'd like to develop my own argument, if you don't mind. And he would just go on with an absolutely uninterrupted flow of majestic eloquence. And um, speaking about you, just because you're talking about Labour and Tory MPs there, what is it with this Damascene conversion that you've had, which seems to be counterintuitive? <laughs> you've gone from being quite hard right to left as you've got older. That's not the way it's meant to work, John. You're meant to become more right-wing as you get older. What's so says on? Camilla Tomini. Well, so, so says, says GB News. There, there's so something says about the having right a, there's a There's a quote about having a heart and a brain. And yeah. It's that you know this to be true. So you've become more left-wing as you got... What's that, all that about? I think that after a long period of reflection and the experience of electoral wipeouts of the Conservative Party, I came to the conclusion that the Conservative Party was wrong-headed on several fronts. So it wasn't a Damascene conversion, it was a process of gradual evolution of political thinking, from being very right-wing to seeing the shortcomings and weaknesses of a hard right position in terms of the damage to you couldn't call public the government services, now hard right the level of inequality and so on. The Conservative Party... What, under Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt? The Conservative Party has moved right over a period of many years. Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt are presenting a different face to the Conservative Party from that presented by Boris Johnson or Liz Truss. But deep down, they are the party of the hard right. The Conservative Party is unrecognisable from the party of Heath or even, to some degree, of Thatcher. And certainly, that is why people like Michael Heseltine, Chris Patton, etc., find it so difficult these days to say anything positive about their former but party. It's left What's your them. relationship now? with Labour? Have you been suspended by Labour? Well, there was a suspension at the time. I pay a subscription for the Labour Party, but I'm not involved in active politics. I come on your show at your kind request. I know, request. And I'm grateful that you've come um, on. I'm delighted I'm, to do so. That. But I'm here very much in the capacity of a commentator. So if you look me in the eye, Camilla, and say to me, you know, John, have you got some plan behind your furrowed brow yes. to arrange a return to frontline politics. I have absolutely what, no what, plan what to return to frontline politics at all. What do you want to do? Because obviously it's quite unprecedented, but you haven't been given a peerage. You're not in the House of Lords. Sure. Are you now advocating Labour's policy of abolishing the House of Lords? I think the Labour Party wants to get rid of the House of Lords as it currently stands and to replace it with something else, and I think there's a lot to be said for that. My position is that, as you rightly say, I have moved leftwards over the years. I would like to see, and I very much hope that I will see but were you a upset Labour about government not after the being election. allowed in the House of Lords? Well, I made it clear that if I'd been invited to go to the House of Lords, I would have done so, but that hasn't happened. I mean, it's I'm Boris not... Johnson has, I think, appointed a 29-year-old spad to the House of Lords, yeah. and not you. Look, I'm not a trophy hunter, and I would hope that even my most acerbic critics would accept that in office, for example, over a decade as Speaker, I sought to do things. I attempted to make a difference. Yes. I you went about the process the of transformation. Of I tried to reform the House to make it more lively, more dynamic, more interrogative, more contemporary, more relevant. And I tried to reform the way we operated across the parliamentary estate. So I did all sorts of things to make the place more child-friendly, more focused on young people, to build a relationship with civil society and so on. But there are people who are in public life, hopefully a minority, in pursuit of baubles, in pursuit of status, and that's in not pursuit you, of accolades. That wasn't me. What I'm concerned about is trying to do things that make a difference. What do I do now? I do a lot of public speaking for you a living. You come on GB News with me. I 
work as an academic lecturer at London University. I come on GB News to talk to very agreeable people like you. And we haven't even, Camilla, I mean, stone the crows and oh, we haven't even got there. We'll have to do another one. Tennis. John, and you thank and I you. love tennis.